ဟုတ်ပြီးတော့ကျွန်တော်တို့ဩတွဲပြီးတော့ကျွန်တော်ဩဂနိုင်ဆ်လုပ်ပြီးလုပ်ပြီးတာပါ။ပထမကြေညာ
background um, structure, which we can use for all paediatric emergencies, and we're going to talk through them in detail. Um, but first of all, of course, when we're looking at an airway, does that airway need clearing? Is that airway safe? And um, does it need any intervention such as suction or positioning? And sorry, my computer's being a bit slow. And then breathing. So we are obviously looking for any signs of respiratory distress, whether they are breathing very fast or even worse, they are breathing very slow, which is a pre-terminal sign. And clearly, if there is any significant respiratory distress, then we are going to give oxygen, which we normally start at two liters per minute via nasal cannula. And then simple things such as not handling them very much, so staying away from them and letting children normally find the best place for them to breathe themselves. So rather than trying to lie them down on a couch, if they are happy sitting up using all of their muscles to work to, 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 to breathe, sometimes it is best to leave them to get into the place that is most appropriate for them. Uh, and sitting them up on the bed may help them use those accessory muscles. Then obviously we're moving on to circulation and we're looking particularly for signs of shock. And we know that children who are in shock or who are septic have the highest mortality um, out of most common pediatric conditions. So if they have cold hands, they have a weak peripheral pulse, a capillary refill time over three seconds um, and lethargy, then they are in a state of shock and clearly they need very quick management. And we're going to go on to talk about some of these, um, some of the approach to these conditions. But generally, if you have a child who is shocked, they will fall into one of these categories. They will either have lost a lot of fluid um, and have severe diarrhea, in which case we'll be treating with plan C um, and giving lots of, lots of fluid to them. They may have severe anemia, for example, in severe malaria or even dengue shock. Um, and they may need, um, they, they may need uh, red cells, so they may need instead of fluid. They may be malnourished, in which case they will need um, more careful fluid management. They may just have shock from sepsis, or they may have proper dengue shock syndrome in which we will follow their dengue management. Um, and we're going to, this is just the kind of general approach that we're doing airway breathing and circulation and identifying problems and treating them as we go. And the key in all of these things is that we need to identify symptoms, we then need to treat those symptoms, and then we need to treat the cause of those symptoms. And again, I know everybody knows this because you are all very experienced um, doctors and you have seen many children, I'm sure, but Sometimes if you see a baby who is one day old or a child who is eight years old, who is very unwell, it can get a little bit overwhelming. So if you think I only have to do two things, I have to think A, B, C, and I have to think I identify the, what symptoms there are, I treat what symptoms that there are, and then I treat the cause of those symptoms. And the easier we can make it, the more successful we normally are. So first of all, identifying some of these symptoms, just paediatric vital signs. I don't know if anyone has a good way of remembering them, but what I want to introduce quickly is that I think most people probably know what the adult ranges are. So if you look at the green at the bottom, the adult ranges, heart rate is 60 to 100, the respiratory rate 15 to 20, and the systolic blood pressure 100 to 120. So you already know that, I'm sure, because you deal with adults all the time. So I would ask you just to try to remember the infant one at the top. So if you can remember that the maximum heart rate, the normal heart rate for an infant is 120 to 160 beats per minute. The respiratory rate is 30 to 40, and the systolic blood pressure is 70 to 90. Then you can work out all of the rest. So this is a cheat. This is an easy way to remember that if you look at the infant, so look at the infant heart rate, 120 to 160. If they are preschool, so one to five years, then you just move the boundary down by 20. So instead of 120 to 160, it is now 100 to 140. If they are school age, then you move it down again by 20. So 80 to 120. And then when they are 12, you move it down to 60 to 100. So instead of having to remember all of these values, if you just remember what an adult is, and what an infant is, then you can work out if it is one step up or one step down from either of those. And I learned that probably 15 years ago when I started my pediatric career, and that still is with me today because I find it very easy to follow that pattern. So same with the rest rate, go down by five each time. So 30 to 40, then 25 to 35, 20 to 30 and 15 to 20. And obviously with the systolic blood pressure, 
we're going up in tens, so from 70 systolic to 80 to 90 to 100. And for me, that makes more of a pattern that makes it easier to remember. So we're going to work through the ABCs, if that's OK, and we're going to talk about various conditions on the way. Um, if you can give Caroline a little bit of feedback in the meantime, if things are a little bit too easy or a little bit too detailed or not what you want, please do let her know and I will be happy to talk in more or less detail or whatever you prefer. So first of all, from the airway perspective, the question is, if you are hearing airway noises and we first thing we do is we look and we listen, if you're hearing airway noises, the question is, where are they coming from? And there's three places that airway noises come from. And it's normally the top one that people don't know quite as much, but from your nose to your larynx is called stertor. And that's kind of that really snorry noise. So you are like that, and you have secretions in your airway and you are at risk of losing your airway, either because you are not conscious or because you have a foreign body, or maybe you have some compression. So maybe very large tonsils, a quinsy, something like that. Then true strider comes from your larynx to your carina. So strider is obviously one of the most severe signs of an um, upper respiratory tract symptoms and um, because it means that your airway is closing. And you may remember that the diameter of your um, airway is proportional to the flow to the power four. So if your airway closes by two times, the flow of your airway will close by 16 times. So it is really important that we recognize the signs of a, of a closing airway. And Strider is one, is one of them that affects your trachea and your larynx. And that's the classic <laughs> kind of noise. And the softer it is, sometimes the more worrying it is because we are not moving as much air. Then obviously below the carina, we are down to where the, where the trachea bifurcates into the bronchi, we are down to bronchospasm and we're gonna hear wheeze, crepitations and transmitted sounds. And children's airways are a little bit different to adults. So if you have a very sick child who comes to you, opening their airway may actually save their life. And in general, the smaller the child, so the closer to birth, the bigger the head is compared to the rest of their body. Again, the smaller the child, the bigger their tongue is compared to the rest of their body. So they've got a big head and a big tongue. And obviously they've got quite a small airway as well. So that, that head and that tongue can actually obstruct their airway. And this is the normal position that a baby will get into if you lie them flat on a, um, on a, on a, on a couch, on a table or on the floor. And you can see that their chin is down and their big, their big head means that it pushes, their, pushes their, their chin down and their head forward, which is going to obstruct their airway. So the ways that we can overcome that are to gently move the head into a neutral position for a baby. So under one year old, neutral. And by neutral, we mean if you draw a line across the nose and the mouth, it will be the same line as the table. So we are not um, head tilting. We are not sort of... Um, sort of jaw, lifting the jaw and tilting the head, and we are going neutral. Obviously, when we are older, so when we are maybe over eight years old, we can do a head tilt chin lift, as we would in adults. And then in between, we are looking for what we call sniffing the morning air. So if you are between one year and about six to eight years, you want to be somewhere in between those two. So not head tilt chin lift, not neutral, somewhere in between. Okay. And that may say that may save a life one day if you are if you are preventing an airway from being obstructed. Obviously, if they are not breathing, then you will need to do bag valve mask and over the top of that. But that is the position you are aiming for, and you must always look for chest wall movement to make sure that they are actually moving some air. So, if you are finding that they have an airway obstruction, so if they have signs of strider, and maybe they have low oxygen levels or they have signs of respiratory distress, there are a few things that we can do to make the situation a little bit better. So the first one is actually step away from the child. And I don't know if everybody thinks that that is a good idea or a bad idea, but um, if a child is very sick and they are really working with their breathing, then if you step away from them, you keep them on their mother's lap, you will make everything much better. 
because if they cry, they will obstruct their airway more, they will cause more inflammation, and they will be more unwell. So calm them down, do not take them off their parent, settle the situation and make more assessment. You should not examine the throat either if they are really working with their breathing and they have strider. If they are working hard and it is, a, it is an airway emergency, then of course, try to give them oxygen. But sometimes you will find that they hate the oxygen. And I don't know if you, you have seen, I'm sure many, many children, if you put oxygen near them, they're like, ah, leave me alone, take the oxygen away. And, and then again, they will get more upset and they may, again, they may even lose their airway if they get really upset. So if it's needed and it's tolerated, then you can hold high flow oxygen a little bit away from the child and it will still give them oxygen, but it will not scare them as much. And again, you will not risk your um, losing your airway. Obviously, get help if available. So if you have other colleagues around or if you are able to get to a hospital facility, then that is going to be helpful as soon as possible. And then it is our job to reduce the inflammation because that's what's causing the problem in most upper airway, most upper airway conditions. So. The quickest way to do that is to give an adrenaline nebulizer. And you can give uh, one is to 1000 adrenaline nebulizer, 0.4 mils per kilo up to five mils as a maximum. So if they are a big child, give them five mils. If they are small, maybe think about calculating a dose. And that is a nebulizer, gets straight into the airway and reduces that inflammation straight away. So it takes five minutes, lasts for about 30 minutes and you can repeat that as necessary. They will obviously get a bit tachycardic, but it is a helpful thing to have. And I don't know if you have in your, in your clinics um, adrenaline that is one is to 1000 that you can put into a nebulizer device if you have available. If not available, then it's about giving steroids, although they will work much slower. So steroids maybe work in four hours, they will take to reach their maximum. And maybe they start working in one hour, but they take some time and dexamethasone is the is the the, the medicine of choice and 150 micrograms per kilo and if they are very sick you can give up to 0.6 milligrams per kilo and you can also give prednisolone if you have it or obviously if you if they are already cannulated or you you, you don't have any of this and you only have IV then you can give hydrocortisone and if you have any budesonide, then two milligrams is the flat dose of budesonide to give through a nebulizer. And then obviously if there is an underlying cause, then we need to treat the underlying cause. And we're gonna think of some of those underlying causes now. But in general, if you have strider, step away from the child, give them oxygen, get some help, and then think about whether you have either adrenaline or steroids available to reduce the inflammation. So just to think about some underlying causes, these are three of the classic things that people think about when they think about children, particularly with fever, and when they have an upper respiratory tract problem with strider and difficulty in breathing. And because there are so many people on the call, I will probably not ask for interaction too much if that's okay, and I will continue. But if anyone has any questions, please do jump in. So I'm just going to compare croup, bacterial tracheitis, and epiglottitis. So croup, is viral. It's always viral and it's mainly para-influenza virus, although there are many others as well. Whereas the other two are bacterial. So clearly bacterial tracheitis is bacterial and epiglottitis is caused mainly by the same bug, so Haemophilus influenza B. In the UK, most people are vaccinated against that, but in areas where vaccination is less prevalent, then obviously epiglottitis is, and bacterial tracheitis are still possibilities. Normally, croup presents with a really harsh strider, so they're going to like that, and a barking cough that I cannot do an, an imitation of. I have tried, but I sound very stupid when I do, so I'm not going to do that. But if you compare that to the epiglottitis, they are not moving much air. They are very sick with epiglottitis, and maybe they have a very soft strider, so a, like that, and they are not moving much air. As I say, normally in croup, they are, they are normally clinically well. They maybe look viral. They maybe have some difficulty breathing in the worst cases, but they look okay. In bacterial tracheitis or epiglottitis, they are normally toxic. They look septic. They look like they have a bacterial infection. And classically in epiglottitis, they cannot swallow their secretions. So they will have lots of drooling and their secretions will come out forwards. 
nearly all of these illnesses affect children under the age of six years. And croup is very, they are coughing lots and lots in croup, whereas in epiglottitis, again, they are quiet. They are quiet and they are sick. Croup normally comes on overnight. It's an acute, quick onset, whereas epiglottitis maybe is six hours, maybe even eight to 12 hours, and in some cases, and becoming more and more systemically unwell. With croup, they can be treated with the dexamethasone that we mentioned on the last page, or with the adrenaline if they are very unwell. And the dexamethasone will last for about 24 hours. And normally you only have one bad night with croup, and it's rarely life-threatening. However, on the other side, epiglottitis is seriously life-threatening and needs immediate management um, in a hospital setting, ideally where there is ENT available to do a front of neck airway if, if, if required. So realizing that they have epiglottitis early again, can be life-saving to get them to the right facility. Croup, we're going to treat just with supportive treatment, so giving the steroids. And then bacterial tracheitis, we're going to be giving some IV antibiotics and epiglottitis as well. They're going to need keftraxone, and they're probably going to be septic, so they're going to need some fluid boluses as well. And just to give a um, visual representation of what they look like, this looks like a well child who looks very viral. This is a, a, tr a trachea that's coated in pus, so that looks fairly nasty, but there's still some airflow there. And then that's what epiglottitis looks like actually in the larynx. And you can see there's a huge swelling and inflammation there, which is making this child very dangerous. And that's why you must step away from them, give them some adrenaline nebulizers, and then and think about getting them to the most appropriate facility. Okay, just other underlying causes. I'm sure everyone can guess what this underlying cause is. Um, sorry, it's not a very good photo. Um, but they look like they've got swollen lips, they've got an urticaria or a rash, and we'll say that they had some peanuts or some amoxicillin very recently, maybe both, who knows, maybe both. Um, so this is obviously anaphylaxis, and there's another differential diagnosis for a patient who has got strider and difficulty in breathing. And they have simplified the management of this in the international guidelines recently. Uh, I presume it is the same in adults, but I do not treat adults anymore because they are very big. Um, but the keys to management are to lie the patient down and with their legs in the air, ideally, so that you kind of um, you improve their venous return um, from, a set, from a shock perspective. Or to sit them up if they are happier doing that so that they can breathe better. It's not having them standing up or too vertical, basically, because you do not want to drop their blood pressure. And clearly, you want to remove the allergen if it's still there. So if, there are, they are, have it, if they've just had some amoxicillin, they're going to have some more, then take it away or um, take away whatever, whatever is causing the problem. We should give some IM adrenaline. And a good, a good sort of approximation is that when you are over 12, you have adult dose of most medications. So adult dose is 500 micrograms or 0.5 mils of adrenaline, one in 1000. When you are six to 12, you have about half that. When you are under six, you have about half of that. So you go from 500, then about half 300, and then half 150. And this is the same for hydrocortisone. It is the same for chlorphenamine that you halve the dose from 12 to six to under six. and Sometimes it is just a nice, a nice um, rule in your head. Obviously, you'll give oxygen. If they have anaphylactic shock, they're going to need a fluid bolus. And, and you can give an IM adrenaline up to every five minutes if their respiratory symptoms continue. But if we were to boil this down to the most important point, it's just give IM adrenaline. That is what is going to save the life in anaphylaxis. So give it and then give it again five minutes later. Give it again five minutes later if you need to. If they're still resistant, they need to be in hospital on an IV ad uh, adrenaline infusion. But if you have given I IM adrenaline, you need to watch them for at least six hours because there is the possibility that they will get better, but then get worse again. So they must be observed for at least six hours in your clinic if you ever have to give an IM adrenaline injection, and they, even if they are well after it. And I don't know if you can see what is down in this child's uh, airway, but that looks like a lot of white stuff in their airway, and that may well be a pseudo web, uh, which might show that there's some diphtheria present. And again, in unvaccinated communities, you may well come across diphtheria in the community. So again, if they have significant work of breathing, then consider giving oxygen, give an adrenaline nebulizer if you want to open up that airway, 
Um, benzyl penicillin is the, the drug of choice, so it's very sensitive to penicillins. Um, so uh, 50,000 international units uh, per dose every six hours. And then remember that diphtheria has the toxin pr production, which can cause a number of other um, uh, complications such as cardiac uh, cardiotoxicity and renal um, impairment. So giving diphtheria antitoxin, if that is available, 60,000 units um, is, uh, is, is sort of the, the, the definitive treatment. It's normally good to give a 0.1 mil test dose first to make sure there is no um, anaphylactic reaction. If there is a reaction over one centimeter, then you give the IM adrenaline to cover them when you give the antitoxin because they still need it. Okay, all right. So that's 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 kind of airway. I was going to move on to breathing, circulation, convulsions, and dehydration. Can I just have a very quick stop moment? And if anyone wants to ask any questions on airway or they want to tell me that they want that this is not very useful and they want something different, then now is your time. Okay, Caroline, are we happy? Nothing in the chat either. Great. Okay, thank you. And um, please do interrupt me anytime. So um, we'll move on to breathing. So I've tried to, obviously there are more airway conditions. There is a foreign body, but I think we can imagine how to manage that. Um, and retropharyngeal abscess, which I didn't uh, pop, pop on there, but I'm trying to cover the, the, core, the, the, the core issues in each area. So let's move on to breathing and let's think again about one, two, three, identifying the symptoms, treating the symptoms, and then treating the cause. We did have one so, question. Sorry, just, yes. Um, it was just a question about what is the strength of adrenaline used for adrenaline nebulizers? To reduce yeah, the so, it's, so it's one is to 1,000. Um, and as a general rule, when you put adrenaline into the vein, it is always one is to 10,000. But when you put it anywhere else, if you put it into the muscle or you put it into the uh, into a nebulizer, it is one is to one thousand. So it is stronger when it is one is to one thousand. Okay. There's a All few right. questions coming in now, but I can go back to them at the end. Cool. Okay. Right. I'll carry on. Do hold those questions, and uh, I will very happily answer them at the end. Right. So breathing. So first of all, we need to recognize that the signs of respiratory distress, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with what those are. But just to recap, you can have recessions where children and babies do not have a fixed chest wall like adults do. They do not have as much cartilage or as much muscle there. So when they use those muscles, you can see them dipping in underneath their ribs, between their ribs, up around their trachea. So we could have substernal recession that looks like this on a real baby. We could have subcostal recession that looks like this, which you can just see the, the kind of V-shape underneath the, 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 the costal margin. Intercostal recession, where they suck in underneath their ribs, uh, sorry, between their ribs, and tracheal tug, which is just at the top there, sort of in the, in the sternal notch. And these are all signs that a child has respiratory distress. I should also say that the older the child gets, the more severe the respiratory distress is when you see these signs. So if a baby has subcostal or intercostal recession, they do not have much muscle. It is, it is an early uh, sign. If a seven-year-old has the same recession, it is much worse in the seven-year-old because they have lots of muscles and cartilage and you should not be able to see it as easily. Okay. You may also be, so this is just a, a video of, um, of, of this. And just if you li just listen to the sound as well that this baby is making, oh, it's not gonna work, is it? Sorry, go on, go on, work for me. No, okay, this did, oh yeah, there we go. So can you see in that video that that baby has obviously subcostal and intercostal recessions, but again, just there and the way that they are sitting as well, they are sitting up, they are doing it themselves. They are saying, I need to be sitting up to get all this, the, the air in that I need. So they will find their own position. The other thing is they are making a grunting noise. So grunting is when you give yourself CPAP. You are giving yourself pressure in your airways and um, to open up your airways more. And that is quite a severe sign of respiratory distress. So that child has, I would say, moderate to severe respiratory distress and definitely needs some intervention. 
So we've identified the symptoms of respiratory distress, and now we need to treat them. So just a quick thing that obviously anyone who has either saturations under 92%, if we have a pulse oximeter, or signs of significant respiratory distress needs oxygen. There is almost no baby that you can cause harm to by giving oxygen. So in adults with COPD, it can be a problem to remove their hypoxic drive. In children, that is almost never a problem. So do not worry about giving, um, giving oxygen to most children. We can start with nasal cannula. That is about two liters per minute, up to four liters per minute. And what sometimes is good if you have a very sick child is to put a face mass of oxygen over the top of that as well. And then you can do double oxygen. And sometimes that is a good strategy, but you need two oxygen points. So two concentrators and to use a non rebreathe bag like this, you must have at least eight liters going through. Otherwise they will actually retain CO2 through it. So you need to inflate the bag fully and um, to be able to use a non rebreathe bag like this. And as we said before, positioning wise, we might want to sit them up to make it easier for them to breathe. So just thinking about treating the underlying cause, I think we can see on this one that this, that this patient who came in with cough and difficulty in breathing and a fever has got a good right upper and middle zone pneumonia. And then this one has got pneumonia with a large effusion as well. So the Myanmar Pediatric Society guidelines um, um, from the app and from and just in general um, suggests uh, this treatment. So you can grade the severity of the pneumonia by whether they are able to drink, whether they are lethargic or whether they are alert. Obviously, if they have any convulsions or if they are malnourished, they have very severe pneumonia. If they have severe pneumonia, they will have significant chest and drawing that we have just seen and low saturations. And if they have any of these other symptoms, so pneumonia that's not improved yet after you've given them oral antibiotics, they've got a comorbidity such as congenital heart disease, they're dehydrated, or they're having short periods of stopping breathing. And in children, we call an apnea for 10 seconds. So if they stop breathing for longer than 10 seconds, or if they change color, then that is an apnea. And for any of those interventions, they need to go to hospital and they need to be admitted into the clinic or into the hospital. The first line for a, a severe pneumonia that needs IV treatment would be ampicillin and gentamicin. And second line would be kermoxiclav or kefotaxine. Obviously, if they are showing signs of sepsis or shock, we're going to treat them in the C section as per the sepsis protocol, but we need to sort the breathing out first. Obviously, that effusion will need draining as well, so that will need a chest drain. But particularly for general practice in the community, if none of those um, symptoms are present, so the symptoms, oops, sorry, the symptoms that we mentioned, including being lethargic, um, being malnourished, um, unable to drink, significant chest in drawing or not improving on oral antibiotics, for example, um, then at home, um, they can be on oral amoxicillin, which will be 40 milligrams per kilogram per dose, um, or second line, either kefuroxine, coamoxiclav, or azithromycin. Obviously, just think about if there are any other conditions which are going on, such as um, asthma, whether they have a complication like an empyema, whether they could have a foreign body, particularly on that right lung, so maybe that right upper zone possible foreign body, could they have, could they have um, ingested something? And just your differential diagnosis for any difficulty in breathing is heart failure. So I'm just going to talk about wheeze quickly. And, and this is one of the most common things we see in the UK. And when you listen to the chest, obviously in pneumonia, you're going to hear crepitations, ideally in one place rather than the others. Whereas wheeze, you're going to hear probably everywhere. And wheeze, as we know, is an expiratory sound and causes a prolonged expiratory phase. So you may, only, you may not hear a wheeze sometimes, but you'll see that they breathe in very quickly and out slowly. So kind of... <sighs> like that. And that is a sign of bronchospasm, even though you cannot actually hear the wheeze. So generally speaking, we can classify wheezes into these areas. And this is very much the UK feeling on this. And you may have different feelings on it, and there is different feelings in other parts of the world. And, but this is very much what, what we would say from the UK perspective. That under one year, if you have a wheeze, you almost certainly have what we call bronchiolitis. In some places, they'll say under two years is bronchiolitis. In the UK, we say it's under one. Then between one year and five years, you have viral induced wheeze, so a wheeze caused by a virus. And at some point, that may become asthma if that is recurrent. So you have viral induced wheeze in the younger ones, 
you might then start seeing a multi-trigger wheeze where they get wheeze with um, allergens as well, cold air, exertion, um, although from my time in Myanmar there wasn't much cold air to cause that, but maybe up in the up in the hills in, uh, in Shan State or something. Um, and um, then as they get a bit older and they're having more and more, um, uh, then, then we're looking more at a classic asthma. And my feeling on this is that just, just to think about it, is that the young ones, they have very small muscle in their airways. And when they get sick, they have lots of inflammation there. And the inflammation causes mucus. So this is the reason why they have wheeze, because they have a narrow airway, which has lots of inflammation and then lots of mucus. If you contrast that to the slightly older children over one year, 18 months, but definitely over two years, they have more, more significant muscle in their airway. And then that muscle contracts, that is bronchospasm. And sure, there is a little bit of inflammation, but not to the same degree. And critically, on their muscles, they have bronco, they have beta receptors. So these beta receptors mean that salbutamol and bronchodilators will be effective. One key point is that definitely under six months of age, bronchodilators are not effective. You should not use salbutamol or ipratropium bromide in a child under six months. And in the UK, we would also say that you should not use salbutamol or ipratropium bromide in a child even under one year, because it will not be effective. They do not have the muscle in their airway to be effective. And you can see that these two, these two children, these two airways have the same amount of air going through them. So that's what's causing the wheeze. But the one on the left has so much mucus that when you listen, you will hear crepitations. So you will hear crackles all over the chest. Whereas on the right, you will only hear, and on the right, you will only hear um, wheeze alone. So bronchiolitis, wheeze and crepitations, and um, viral induced wheeze and asthma on the right, just wheeze. And we treat them in different ways. So the asthma escalation for general practice, I will just go through this quickly. But if a child comes to you with a wheeze who is over the age of one and you feel that um, bronchodilators are helpful and that wheeze has to be everywhere on their chest and they do not have many crepitations, then what we would suggest is giving three lots of salbutamol. And it's up to you to choose how many puffs you want to give each time if you have the inhaler. Ideally, you should use a spacer in every child who has salbutamol. And that may be that you can use a Diet Coke bottle um, or a Coca-Cola bottle um, with, the, with the end chopped off um, to put in the um, salbutamol and to put over their face um, and obviously clean it first. So in the UK, we would give 10 puffs and then 20 minutes later, another 10 puffs and then 20 minutes later, another 10 puffs of salbutamol. The Myanmar guidelines say six puffs um, every 10 to 15 minutes. We'd also give prednisolone if you feel that they are a little bit older and have an, an allergic component. So normally for us, this would be in children over the age of three, but again, there is difficult evidence to know exactly what to do. If they are not able to have salbutamol up to one hourly, so if you give the three lots of salbutamol, you then reassess them in one hour. If they're not able to stretch to one hour because they are working very hard and they have those signs of respiratory distress, then they are going to need some IV medication. And the options for IV medication are magnesium sulfate, salpicemol IV, or aminophilin or theophylline IV. So you can give those as a single push, or you may need to step up to an infusion to give a continuous infusion of either, and rarely they may need intubation and ventilation. But we are straying away from the community general practice management at that stage. Obviously, they will have oxygen as required. And what you are trying to do is see if they are safe to go home on regular salbutamol that ideally should be no more than four hourly. So if they need more and more puffs of salbutamol to keep the respiratory distress away, then they should not go home until they can manage at least three to four hours with no salbutamol. And then they can continue at home as and when required. Okay, but this is for the children over the age of one when we think that this will be effective. For the severity of asthma, I just put this up here. So just, it's just obviously important to recognize severe or life-threatening asthma, which is associated with hypoxia, an inability to speak or to drink. And if they are not alert, 
or if they are severely tachycardic and tachypneic. For those, as you can see at the bottom, 100 micrograms of, so that's one puff of salbutamol um, times six, so six puffs, um, or a nebulizer 2.5 milligrams, and repeat that three times every 20 minutes. Prednisolone two milligrams per kilo, and then refer to an appropriate um, setting. Okay, the other condition that we were talking about was bronchiolitis. And so this is for the younger children under the age of one, and some countries may feel under the age of two. The risk factors for severe bronchiolitis, and these are the ones to pick up in the community in general practice, are the ones who are under three months, who are small babies, who are more fragile, babies who were born premature, particularly if they were on a neonatal unit, babies with chronic lung disease, congenital heart disease, or neurological disorders. And the times that they definitely need sending to child ward would be if they have an apnea, so over 10 seconds, they have a respiratory rate more than 60, if they have the severe respiratory distress that we have already seen, if they have um, hypoxia, so saturations under 90, or poor feeding under 50% of normal. Obviously with any of those comorbidities as well, that's when they will definitely need referral um, and admission to a paediatric unit. And otherwise the treatment is just supportive. So there's two things we care about in bronchiolitis. It's the breathing, obviously, but also the feeding. So it may be that most babies need no breathing support. So if they do not um, have an oxygen requirement, if their oxygen levels are 92 or above, they do not need any breathing support. Obviously, if their oxygen levels are below 92, they need oxygen. And if they're working very hard, they may need some non-invasive ventilation, some CPAP. And a very small number will need intubation. On the feeding, most children will need just to have little and often feeding. So when you are breathing fast as a baby, it is very difficult to be able to feed effectively because you are trying to breathe and feed at the same time and you must breathe through your nose and your nose is blocked. So if they normally have, let's say, 120 mils every, or a 20 minute breastfeed every four hours, maybe they can have a 10 minute breastfeed every two hours or even a five minute breastfeed every two hours for 50% of normal feeds. And they will be able to tolerate that without aspirating and without making their breathing worse. So go little and often feeds. If they are not tolerating that and they cannot get anywhere near 50% of normal, and if they show any signs of dehydration, then they will need NG feeding in their child ward. And for the ones who are working very hard, they maybe need some IV fluids. But antibiotics do not work for this. Adrenaline does not work for this because it is lower respiratory. Um, saline nebulizers do not work. Salbutamol does not work. Ipotropium bromide does not work. Okay, so it is just supportive treatment with oxygen and feeding support. Okay, so those are the three main things I wanted to talk about in breathing. Just in the interest of time, we are going to move on to cardiovascular. And again, we're going to try to identify symptoms, then treat them, and then treat the cause. So thinking about signs of cardiovascular insufficiency, and the most important thing we want to recognize is shock. So signs when you're examining any child is obviously what is the temperature of their hands and their feet? Do they have cold hands? Do they have a weak peripheral pulse? Do they have a prolonged capillary refill? And in children, it is always best to do it on the chest where you can see that they have done it there. Press for five seconds. And I don't know if you do this already, but when you release your finger, say zero. And then as you release your finger, say zero, and then count one, two, three, like that. Otherwise, if you say, release your finger and say one, two, three, everything will be prolonged because you have not given one second before you said one. So if you release your finger, zero, one, two, three, and then you get an accurate reading. And, and you will check if they are lethargic. And just in general, I would like to say that lethargy is one of the, I think, the most serious problems for a child, because if you are septic, you will get lethargic. If you are dehydrated, you will get lethargic. If you have severe complicated malaria, you will get lethargic. So lethargy is a common pathway that all children get when they are getting very unwell. So if you see a lethargic child, you need to follow your ABC approach and you need to treat them. So if they have all of these things, cold hands, weak pulse, prolonged capillary refill and lethargy, then they have shock and we need to act on that. 
I'm going to come on to the treatment of shock in two seconds. But before that, they will probably also be tachycardic. And I just want to point out that inappropriate tachycardia is an early sign of sepsis, and it is the most sensitive sign of sepsis in children. So in adults, maybe adults have been smoking, maybe they have had cardiac disease, and their heart will not compensate for sepsis as much as children. So for children, if they get sepsis, their heart will say, I need to pump faster, and it will pump very, very fast before their blood pressure drops. So if you're seeing a, a child who is tachycardic, just think about whether that is an early sign of sepsis. They may have other reasons for tachycardia. They may be crying, they may be in pain, they may have a fever. So if you can, try to get the fever down and then reassess them and see what their heart rate is. If it is back to normal, that is reassuring. If it is not back to normal when their fever comes down, is it a sign of sepsis? And that is quite an important early sign before you get the signs of shock. Blood pressure is a very late sign. So once your blood pressure starts dropping, you are in big trouble as a, as a, as a child. So do not trust the blood pressure. If your blood pressure is okay, it does not mean that the child is not okay. Okay, so just be careful and it is a very late sign. So if they have those signs, we diagnose shock, we give oxygen, and obviously we refer to the most appropriate place. If we're thinking about treatment in the meantime, we need to think about those things we talked about at the beginning and think about the reason why they are in shock. So if they have just lost a lot of fluid through diarrhea and vomiting, then we need to start plan C, um, which we will sh show you in a second. If they have severe anemia, anemia so they have obvious pallor, they look very, very pale, if they might have malaria or they had any bleeding or hemolysis, then they will need a blood transfusion. If we give fluid, they will only reduce their, um, their hemoglobin even more. If they have malnutrition, then we must give them slow um, fluids over one hour. So half strength ringolactase and 5% dextrose is the, is the um, uh, fluid of choice for malnutrition. And, and we give that slowly over one hour so we don't overload a weak heart. And then if we have shock without diarrhea, anemia or malnutrition, then we can give a bit more fluid and we can give 10 to 20 mils per kilo of ringolactate relatively quickly. And for dengue shock, you guys will be far more experienced in dengue shock than I am. So I'm going to leave you to that. There are also guidelines for that on the, on the app. So we want to treat the cause of the cardiovascular problem. So if you see a child who has cardiovascular insufficiency, um, then think about which, what treatment you want to give for them. So the, the main things are we want to give fluids and we want to give antibiotics. Um, in the community, if you want to do that, you can give them um, IM keftriaxone, 50 milligrams per kilo if you have it. That is a good antibiotic to give into the muscle and um, to be able to give quickly. Or benzyl penicillin which is 300 milligrams of under one and, and 600 milligrams of over one. I won't go into the inotrope infusions which are used in hospital. And that is talking about cardiovascular insufficiency when they are septic and clearly we are giving antibiotics and fluids for that. But if you see a heart like this or you, you, you see a child who is, who is unwell, with respiratory distress and cardiovascular compromise, how do we know if this could be cardiac in nature rather than respiratory or sepsis? And I think one key thing to look for when you are assessing the um, cardiovascular status is signs of heart failure. And in a baby, that is hepatomegaly, so you cannot see a JVP in most children. The blood doesn't, doesn't get stuck upwards, it gets stuck downwards. So hepatomegaly is the same as a raised JVP in a child. So can you feel any hepatomegaly? Do they have any signs of pulmonary edema or bibasal crepitations? And do they have any peripheral edema that might suggest they are in heart failure? Then for babies, they get breathless or they get very sweaty when they are feeding. So feeding is like doing exercise for a baby. And if they are breathless or they are sweating when they are feeding, sometimes it is a sign of heart disease or cardiac failure. And obviously if they have cyanosis or color change when feeding, this is also a worrying sign. Other signs that you might pick up of cardiac disease might include a murmur, a hypoxia that doesn't get better when you put high flow oxygen on. So if you have pneumonia and you put oxygen on, you expect the, sat the saturations to improve. 
If you have a cardiac problem in a small baby and you put oxygen on, no difference. Maybe it is a cardiac problem. And it is always good practice to feel the femoral pulses for coarctation in any small baby up to even six months. And if you cannot feel a femoral pulse um, or you feel a very, very weak one, then just consider whether there is sign of coarctation. So we mentioned that we would treat children differently if they were malnourished, and I'm sure you already know this, but I will just go over it um, quickly. So just identifying the malnourished patient who is always going to be in emergency or always going to be at very high risk of being very unwell. So as we know, a mid upper arm circumference, um, uh, if you are over six months, is, um, is one way of identifying severe malnutrition. And a mid upper arm circumference under 11.5 centimeters means you have severe acute malnutrition. And if it is under 12.5 centimeters, then you have moderate malnutrition. You can also do this by doing the um, height for weight score or the weight for age score. And you can find the tables on the WHO website or in any WHO book. And then you can work out if they are what their Z number is. This is the standard deviation away from the, from the median number. And if they have a Z score under three, then they have severe acute malnutrition. So just to clarify, severe acute uh, malnutrition, if they have a, a, a mid upper arm circumference under 11.5, their weight for height score is under minus three, or if they have any signs of edema or kwashiorkor, then they are immediately a severe acute malnourished patient. And all patients who have severe acute malnutrition should be admitted to hospital for ongoing management. If they have moderate malnutrition, they could be treated as an outpatient unless they have medical complications, um, such as rapid or inadequate breathing, circulatory impairment, decreased consciousness, convulsions, or any signs of infection, like a fever, or if they're unwilling to feed or they're unable to, to, to manage any appetite. However, all signs of kwashiorkor should, should be admitted to hospital. Okay. And just the things that we are looking for in, um, in uh, malnutrition to start the process are to make sure that they are, um, that we have checked their blood sugar, that we have um, kept them warm, we have assessed them for dehydration, and we have treated them for infection. Those are the things. And uh, the red bits here are the beginning of the treatment for malnutrition. And I remember it by the acronym that hungry hippos, so the hippopotamus, the animal down there, hungry hippos don't eat in Mandalay, or hungry horses do, don't eat in Mandalay. And that is hypoglycemia, hypothermia, dehydration, electrolytes, infection, and micronutrients. Okay, we've got just, um, I know we're just at the hour, just about, I know I started a little bit late. Um, have I got another 10 minutes just to finish convulsion and dehydration? Would that be okay, Caroline, and, and, and all others? I think that should be fine. Thank you. I'm sorry to I'm sorry to go over the hour. But I'm happy to stay afterwards and answer any questions as well. So we have gone through our ABCs and we are getting now to convulsion. And this is obviously a common thing that you may see in children. So we want to treat the symptoms. So I think we can recognize a convulsion when it happens. And but we want to treat the the, um, the symptoms and the four. There are four initial actions that may make things a lot easier for you. Starting a timer is what everybody forgets to do. So as soon as you see a child who is having a seizure or a convulsion, if you get your mobile phone out and you start a timer, it will be very, very helpful to know how long it is going on for and when we need to give medications. So that is the first job. Apply oxygen if you have it. Check a blood glucose if you have, avail if you have a glucometer available. This is something that lots of people forget as well, to check a blood glucose as soon as a seizure starts and call for help if any help is available. If the blood glucose is under 54 milligrams per deciliter or under three millimoles per liter, then give five mils per kilo of 10% dextrose or some buccal dextrose or some glucagon IM if you have it. Any way you can get sugar into a child. You can always also do the same if you do not have a glucometer. So if you have a way of getting sugar in, then it is ruling out one common cause of, um, of convulsions, particularly if the child is at risk of malaria as well. Once you have done that, the point of starting the timer is that you only need to give your first dose of benzodiazepine after five minutes of the child having a seizure. 
So once you have started a timer, applied oxygen if you have it, check the blood glucose and called for help. You have four and a half minutes to stand there and hope that the seizure finishes before you need to do anything. So you do not need to immediately give something, you can wait five minutes. Then you'll give your first dose of benzodiazepine and you can see the doses are down here on the left. So you might want to give diazepam PR, so that's 0.5 milligrams per kilo, diazepam intravenous if you have access, 0.3 milligrams per kilo, buccal midazolam through the mouth, so midazolam mouth and, and lorazepam through the line. Um, midazolam through the mouth is 0.5 milligrams per kilo and lorazepam through the line if you have it is 0.1 milligrams per kilo. So then you'll wait, after you have done that, you'll wait another five minutes for it to take effect. And at 10 minutes, you can give your second dose of benzodiazepine. Then another five to 10 minutes after that, so I would leave it another 10 minutes until 20 minutes actually, and you can consider giving third line management and this you will need IV access for, or they will need to be in a hospital setting for. And any of phenobarbitone, phenytoin, levetiracetam or Keppra or sodium valparate are fine as second line treatment. So benzodiazepines first and then one or combination of these. And it is fine to give phenytoin, for example, first, and then 10 minutes later to try phenobarbitone. So you can try a combination of these, uh, of these um, agents, but hopefully it will have finished by then. If the seizure is going on more than 30 minutes, then they need to be in hospital and they need to be somewhere where they can um, intubate them if necessary, ideally. And just to mention febrile convulsions, which are a common thing in, in children, which you may well have seen many times. Um, febrile convulsions are a seizure which is related to a high fever, and it's to do with the, the speed that the fever rises. So if you have a child with a temperature of 36.51 minutes and 39.5, 10 minutes later, the speed of that rise of temperature lowers your seizure threshold. And in otherwise completely normal children, they can have a seizure. And those are children who are aged between six months and six years. So it's very unusual to get a seizure, a febrile convulsion under six months. So you should treat that as meningitis until proven otherwise if you have a seizure under the age of six months. And if you have it over six years, you should think very carefully about what is happening. Febrile convulsions are very predictable. They last under 15 minutes. They are generalized tonic-clonic, so they cannot be focal, and they resolve by themselves. If they go on over five minutes, you should treat them the same way as you would treat any other seizure by giving the benzodiazepines. But if you know that they have resolved, and the child becomes well again and is completely back to their normal selves, you do not need to give any treatment or any investigations. You can reassure them and send them home. And if their convulsion has happened with a fever lasting under 15 minutes, generalized tonic-clonic, and they are now back to normal. So that's treating the symptoms of a, of a convulsion. Now we just need to think about treating the cause. And if you think that this is a significant cause, so it's not a febrile convulsion, then we need to be thinking about getting them into a hospital setting and treating for potentially bacterial meningitis with keftraxone or kefataxime and amoxicillin. To consider giving IV acyclovir if they are, if we suspect that they have a viral encephalitis or they have any uh, history of herpes contact like a cold sore. I'm sure you are used to treating malaria, but for um, severe complicated malaria, obviously, again, they will need to be admitted to hospital normally on IV artesunate. You can obviously give combination therapy in the community if they are not having severe complicated malaria. And hypoglycemia, we have already talked about. And lastly, we're going to talk about dehydration. So recognizing the symptoms of dehydration, again, I think you are probably very um, experienced in doing this. Um, but in the most severe, they will have a fast or a weak pulse, cool peripheries and a prolonged cap capillary refill with sunken eyes and a prolonged skin pinch. The skin pinch is a very bad sign, particularly in, um, it's just not a very useful sign. I mean, particularly in malnourished children who will always have a prolonged skin pinch. But if you do see those signs, then they have shock. And again, they need to have, um, they need to have the management of shock, which we'll talk about in two seconds. And if they have two or more out of being not alert, unable to drink, sunken eyes, and a very prolonged skin pinch, then they have severe dehydration. So any of these signs together, we will give plan C. 
So plan C, I'm sure you are all aware, is that you give th um, 30 mils per kilo of Ringer's lactate. And if they are under one year old, that is over one hour. And if they are over one year old, that is over 30 minutes. There's a lot of fluid. And then you reassess them. If they are in shock, you need to do the same thing again. If they are not in shock, then you can go on to stage two, which is a further 70 mils per kilo of Ringer lactate over five hours of under one year old and two and a half hours of over one year old. As soon as the child is able to, they can have oral rehydration solution, normally about five mils per kilo per hour. And we need to reassess every 30 minutes if they are that unwell. If you do not have IV access, they just need to get fluid in somehow. Um, so if they can drink, obviously they should drink. If you can put an NG tube in and start them with NG feeds, then that is also helpful. The ones that you maybe see more in the community will be um, the ones who have some dehydration. So if they have two or more of the signs of being restless or irritable, but still alert. They're very thirsty and they have sunken eyes and they have a slightly prolonged skin pinch and they have some dehydration. And that's the WHO plan B um, recommendation, which is giving oral rehydration solution over four hours, and that's 75 mils per kilo in total. They can continue breastfeeding throughout that, and, and they continue, even if they continue vomiting, then they can continue having it. If they are vomiting lots and you have an antiemetic like ondansetron, that can also be very helpful. And if you do not have ORS, you can find recipes for ORS online, or we use half apple juice and half water um, in the UK, which is, it has the same ability as ORS to rehydrate. And this is for non-malnourished patients. Then if they have fewer than two of the above signs, they don't have any dehydration. And even if they are di having diarrhea and vomiting, they can be discharged home on plan A, which is to take fluid after every diarrhea or vomit. Everyone who has diarrhea should also get zinc, and that's 10 milligrams every day if they're under six months and 20 milligrams if they're over six months. And almost no children with diarrhea and vomiting require antibiotics. We would only give antibiotics for bloody stool or there's suspected cholera or there is another sign of um, infection like pneumonia. So if they just have watery diarrhea and vomiting, then they do not need antibiotics. So that has been a run through A, B, C, C, D. So in summary, for any child, don't overcomplicate it. Identify the symptoms that they are unwell. Think where those symptoms are coming from. Treat the symptoms by giving simple things like oxygen, steroids, um, fluids, uh, and anticonvulsants. And then treat the cause by thinking about antibiotics um, or, or any other, um, or I am adrenaline, for example, to treat um, uh, an anaphylaxis. Apply the same structure principles every time. So if you have a child who is very unwell, start with their airway, assess their airway. If everything is okay, move on. If it is not, then treat it there and then in airway. Move on to their breathing. Is everything okay? If not, treat it. Move on to circulation, consider convulsions, and then look at dehydration last. And this is the kind of way to put it together um, into one algorithm that we've talked about. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that hasn't been too boring. Um, and I hope it's been a little bit helpful for you. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions you have. And um, here is the, these are just some um, QR codes for the app, if you would like to get it, um, which is available on Google Play on the left and um, for, uh, for um, Apple iOS on the right. And it is free to get, and it has all of these guidelines on it. There is also a website um, called um, Myanmar Clinical Guidelines, uh, which has all of the same guidelines on it. So you are also very welcome to search for Myanmar Clinical Guidelines um, online and you will find paediatric and other guidelines there, which are the same as this, um, validated by the Royal College of Pediatrics. Fine, I'll stop talking. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, please do ask any questions that you have. There's quite a few Hello. questions in the chat now. Good. Oh, Sonny was saying something. Sonny was saying something. No, please go ahead, Caroline. Uh, if you choose a few questions and, and read them out to Michael and he can respond. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, if we go from sort of the top, there were a few uh, in the um, airway section, which was, so there was one about the duration of dexamethasone um, for airway obstruction. Um, yeah, good question. 
So dexamethasone lasts for about 24 hours. So it onsets about, um, uh, about four hours, uh, peaks, and then lasts for about 24 hours. If you were going to give it for significant airway obstruction um, or for very bad tonsillitis, for example, where they have that stertor and they sound very unwell, um, then you can give them twice a day. So you can give 0.15 milligrams in the morning, 0.15 milligrams in the afternoon. So you can give it twice a day, but the overall action is for about 24 hours. Okay, and then we had one for the um, breathing section, which was how can we know if it is viral induced wheeze or asthma? Um, Good question. How do you change? Yeah. So there are there are two answers to that. I can't actually see anyone. I'm just trying to find. I'm not sure what you can see of me, but I'm just trying to find. Um, trying to find where you've gone. Um, sorry. Uh, oh, there we go. Right, you're back. Sorry, there we go. Um, do, I do apologise. Um, so, um, violent use or asthma. So, there's two answers to that. Number one is it doesn't matter because we treat it exactly the same. So, it's still salbutamol, um, it's still ipratropium bromide, it's still possibly prednisolone. Um, and so, if you're hearing wheeze without crepitations everywhere and they are over one year of age, then they probably have violent use or asthma. The second answer, which is the more which, which the world is trying to get more evidence for, is that if they are between one, eight, one and three, they don't have asthma, pretty much. They have viral induced wheeze. And if you are seeing a child who only presents to you with a virus and a wheeze, so they only get a wheeze, they only get sick when they have an infection, then they have viral induced wheeze. If they present to you and they are getting wheeze when they are when the weather changes, if they have been running and they get wheeze, if they have um, signs of eczema, asthma or hay fever in the family, if with pollen they get wheeze, then that is more of an asthma. Okay, but do not worry too much about it. If they are over the age of one, you will pretty much treat them the same way anyway. So it is just academic to know whether they whether it is asthma or viral induced wheeze. Um, another airway question is, is there any role in steroid in using steroids in bronchiolitis? No, there is no role for using um, steroids in bronchiolitis. It doesn't work. Um, so they have done because bronchiolitis is so common and it's common everywhere in the world and um, more so in cold climates. Obviously, they have spent billions of pounds, billions of pounds and billions of dollars uh, and trillions of chats probably on trying to um, on trying to find cures for bronchiolitis. And there has been no evidence that steroids work at all. So you do not need to give them in bronchiolitis. Um, another question here, more about an approach. Um, how can you approach abnormal heart sounds in children? Things like murmurs, particularly when children are crying or not sort of being playful. Yeah. Yeah, very good question. So um, the question is, is it an innocent murmur or is it a pathological murmur? So an innocent murmur will normally be a very soft murmur. It will be systolic and it'll be at the left sternal edge and, and it'll be less than grade two out of six. And if they also have a fever at the time, if they are also just have a mild other illness, so a viral illness, let's say, then your approach to it could be that if they have no signs of heart failure, so if you look at them, they do not have hepatomegaly, they do not have bibasal crepitations, peripheral edema, they're feeding okay, and they um, have femoral pulses, then you can send them home. And ideally you would see them again, maybe in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and listen to see if the murmur is still there. If the murmur has gone, then this is what we call a flow murmur. And, and it was just there with the infection because increased blood is pumping. Um, but um, if, it is, um, if it is still there and it sounds louder or more harsh, or they have any other symptoms, then they will need referral. If at the beginning they have any signs of hepatomegaly, peripheral edema, difficulty in feeding, cyanosis, any of those other signs that we talked about, which can show heart disease, then they need referral and they need to have an echo scan to see what's going on. In the meantime, this is the last thing I'll say on it, sorry. And in the meantime, if you want, if you see signs of heart failure with a systolic murmur, well, with a murmur that sounds pathological, you can start them on one milligram per kilo of furosemide and one milligram per kilo of spironolactone per day, and which will help offload the heart whilst they are waiting for further investigations. So signs of heart failure, consider starting diuretics. No signs of heart failure, 
consider bringing them back and having another listen. And then and, there was a question. Uh, and I mean, Doctor Doctor Sunny, if you have if you have other if I am saying things which you think you would you would add or you would say different things, please please do please do contradict me. I would go with your expertise on this as as well very much. Uh, Michael, I think you're the expert, and we yes, very glad to hear from you. So please go on. I think Caroline, if you could continue. There's some questions on antibiotics and diarrhea. I think because diarrhea, as you know, is quite common in the Marin. GPs are not sure you suggested no antibiotics. If you could uh, clarify that, Michael. Yeah, so well, I think this is the WHO recommendations as well. That's and it's it's moderately most most non bloody diarrhea is either viral or self limiting or both, um, and so it is rare that acute diarrhea that is not causing severe problems for the child is not looking like a septic child and does not have blood in it it is rare that antibiotics will be useful and most of that will clear up by itself clearly if you have a patient who has chronic diarrhea and um, so over 10 to 14 days um, and you think this is more bacterial and you want to give metronidazole azithromycin ciprofloxacin depending on what your what your local guidelines or your local practice is obviously go for it and if they have bloody diarrhea then i think the guidelines suggest ciprofloxacin as the first uh, as the first um, line antibiotic so for normal diarrhea that is a few days child has a fever non-bloody child is not very unwell there's no good evidence that antibiotics are particularly effective and um, so you are you can reassure them and send them home with good safety netting um, without antibiotics if that's the case Was, does that sound okay dr sunny would you agree with that or Yes, I think it would. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. There's quite a few more questions. I don't know if you can actually see them now, Michael, as well. I probably can, but are you are you okay to are you okay to read them out just so I know where we're up to? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, just one or two more. Yeah. Uh, I guess there's one about kind of where people. I think you've mentioned a few, but what pediatric books and sites are good for learning? Yeah, it depends if you're looking for um, learning, learning or um, or uh, guidelines. And um, so I will say the Myanmar um, clinical guidelines, I, I do think is quite is, is quite good. It's, um, it's, it's it was between the Myanmar Pediatric Society and um, um, find it um, between the Myanmar Pediatric Society and uh, the RCPCH. And so that gives a lot of guidelines. I'm just going to pop that in the chat. Uh, quickly um, then obviously the classic the classic textbook if you're looking for it is Nelson's Pediatrics um, Geek, uh, Don't Forget the Bubbles is probably the other big resource which is uh, an international resource um, which is very which has a lot of very useful topics on pediatrics and it also has a lot of recent evidence base as well um, and they have a number of conferences and that kind of thing so it's called Don't Forget the Bubbles uh, so that is quite a good website to have a look at as well for learning. Well, and you then, just you texted me and said uh, and said Nelson. So yes, Nelson's is the classic, but it is about six thousand pages long. Um, so um, it is a little bit more in depth than you need for your average um, your average consultation. Yeah. Um, so there was there was one about adrenaline and anaphylactic shock about how often, how many times you can give it? As many as you like um, is the answer. So every, so if they have, if they are, if it is an emergency and they have ongoing strider, difficulty in breathing or signs of shock, the only treatment which is going to save their life is adrenaline. That is the only thing that is really going to help. So give it, give it another five minutes, give it another five minutes, and if you are not in a hospital setting, you can continue giving it every five minutes because if they do get to a hospital setting, um, they will get a um, they'll get an adrenaline infusion. So they're literally getting it constantly if by if they are that sick. So it's one of those where the danger of the condition is more than the danger of giving the medication. So just give it because they will die of severe anaphylaxis if you don't. There's one question from Dr. MJ, who I assume is 
probably a hospital doctor rather than a GP, uh, he or she has put down, do we need to give arvifusamide in every case of blood transfusion in children? Yeah, it's a good question. So I would say I would say no, um, but it's one of those where if you feel that they are at all overloaded, so if they have any signs of heart failure, um, if they are malnourished uh, and you don't want to give huge fluid shifts, then yes, I would give furosemide. Um, but as a routine practice, if you give um, slow blood transfusions over three to four hours uh, of 10 to 15 mils per kilo, uh, you shouldn't necessarily need need furosemide for each for, for everyone as, as a matter of course some hospitals will say that and i know some hospitals in sub-saharan africa and um, and uh, potentially even the us i think will will give furosemide a standard but it's the ones that you care about are the ones where you're making big fluid shifts or you're causing fluid overload so if you're not doing that and it's an otherwise you know a child who's otherwise moderately stable uh, then know that you don't you don't need it as standard for everyone Um, there was one about in case of shock due to hemolytic anemia or blood loss. If we can't get blood urgently, what can we do to buy time? That's a very, very good question. Um, so if they are shocked, they need volume. So the Doctors Without Borders guideline, um, I believe, says give double maintenance fluids um, in that situation whilst you're waiting for blood. So if maintenance fluids are... 100, four, four, two, one, so the four mils per kilo per hour uh, for up to 10 kilos, then the two mils per kilo per hour for the 10 to 20 kilos, and then the one mils per kilo per hour after that, um, if you're happy working that out, um, then you double that rate. So you give IV fluids, double that rate until you can get blood, but you need blood um, because you cannot carry oxygen without blood. Um, so that is, a way of, that is a way of bridging the gap in the meantime. How much time do we have, Sunny? I think we probably, yeah, maybe one last question, Caroline, if you choose one and then we'll call it a day. Okay. okay. Um, so why should we change from 5% to 10% dextrose if a child gets hypoglycemia during a dextrose infusion? So just a question about how to manage hypoglycemia. Sure. Um, so managing hypoglycemia. So when you so the first thing to say, which I didn't say before, actually, is so you give your bolus of 10 percent dextrose. So your bolus is always of 10 percent. Um, and then you must always do an infusion after that because they will get normal glycemic for a while and then they will get hypoglycemic again. So you must give them an infusion afterwards. The infusion is normally to start with 5 percent, as you say. And, and so normal saline and 5 percent or ringolactate with 5 percent or whatever you want to use with 5% in. But then if they are still hypoglycemic um, under three millimoles per liter or 54 milligrams per deciliter, then yes, increase to 10% um, dextrose. And you can make that up normally with a, you know, a bag of 50% dextrose and just put the required amount into, um, into the bag of saline. Um, if you then still struggle, then you can give 12.5% dextrose in the bag as well, so that's as high as you can go, really. If you are having to give more than that, then there is something very wrong. Uh, yes, you can use the injection form of adrenaline and nebulizer. You can actually also use the injection form of dexamethasone as oral, if you want it as well, because it's a smaller volume. So injected dexamethasone can be taken orally as well. And then I think there was one question about um, the uh, whether it's systolic or diastolic murmur. The easiest way to do that is nearly all murmurs are systolic, um, nearly all the ones you can hear anyway, or if you're anything like me, I, I, I think diastolic murmurs are very hard to hear. And if you have your finger on the pulse, when the pulse goes, that's systolic. So if it is like that on the pulse, that's a systolic murmur. And if you hear a pulse and it's a like that, it's kind of normally like a lower quality, the diastolic murmurs, then that's diastolic. And but have your hand on the pulse, and if you're hearing with the pulse, then that's always systolic. Okay, it, Sunny, is it time to, do you think it's time yeah, to finish? It's, yeah, I think it's time to finish. I think it's about uh, it's, it's, uh, 10 p.m. in the morning now, so. Oh, uh, right, uh, okay, bedtime. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Dr. Bailey, thank you very much for a very informative and I'm sure very useful uh, 